First of all, just a word, as we are a people of faith and called to pray and to be example, we, of course, recognize our country is continuing to struggle with racial tensions and such, and they haven't gone away, and people would just like to pretend they're not there, but we must be the ones to pray for, for all of that to come together, for us to come together, and to you know, truly find peace. We, above all people, must be the leaders for that, finding that reconciliation through love, the love of Christ. After all, St. John reminds us, right, that heaven, as he, in the book of Revelation, heaven is described as the place of every tribe and nation and language and race, all together worshiping the one God. You and I can help make that a possibility as we pray in Jesus' words, of course, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The current Archbishop of New York, Cardinal Timothy Dolan, was reflecting on an event that was told to him when he was a young priest by the then aging Auxiliary Bishop of St. Louis, George Gottwald. Bishop Gottwald had been a happy, plain country pastor, where he was, unfortunately, out of sheer obedience, he was thrust into leadership as a bishop. And the year was 1968. And as I look out, there are a few of you who might remember 1968. And as chaotic as we think our times can be, apparently 1968 was the, the, the measure of chaos. It seemed that the whole world was on fire all that was going on. One of the most personally distressing crises the bishop had to deal with was, ironically, at his local seminary, Kenrick. By this point in 1968, a lot of the faculty had left the priesthood and students had left their studies. The ones who remained, you might think, were still interested and, and were the, the fine ones that were going to make it. But no, in fact, the ones who remained were discontent. They wanted changes. They demanded changes. In the early spring of 1968, they formed what amounted to a campus demonstration. Remember, this is not a college. This is a Catholic seminary. <laughs> it shows how crazy the time was. They demanded Bishop Gottwald's presence so they could present him with a list of demands. Of course, in front of the obligatory TV cameras and reporters. Into this melee walks the shy, rather nervous Bishop Gottswald, still wishing that he was an unknown pastor in the Ozark Hills of Missouri. <laughs> the leader of the faculty and students remarked that the seminary may as well close since the whole enterprise of priestly formation and theology were up for grabs. Nothing was certain anymore, he said. The bishop commented that, no, in fact, even with sincere questions and, and need for reforms, there still remain clear, consistent truths that needed to be taught. Ha! The spokesman said. I dare you, he said, I dare you to tell me what we can possibly teach our students now that has not changed, that will not change, and that can be stated with any amount of conviction at all. I dare you to tell me. The bishop's mouth went dry, he recalled. All eyes were on him. All you could hear in that moment was the whir and click of those 1968 cameras. And what did he answer? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Of course, it's the Apostles' Creed. You and I just recommitted ourselves at Easter to the same creed put in question and answer format. You might recall, we recommitted with our I do believe. It's a fundamental formula of faith expressed by the church from the very beginning of her days. This, friends, was a man of faith in the midst of doubt and ridicule, snickering and confusion. He dared to state that there are indeed certain truths that can always be counted on because they come from God, not from us. Our faith is not about how we can construct, arrange a belief in merely some sort of higher power or a really super powerful deity or some force in a galaxy far, far away. Our faith, faith in Jesus Christ, hinges on what we are celebrating now. Hinges on not merely a belief, but on eyewitness accounts. That Jesus the Nazarene suffered innocently, was put to death in the worst possible way of the time. He was buried, and everybody went home. This same Jesus, on the third day, rose in a glorified but real body. And because of this, I have to change. Because this means that everything that he said is true. Everything that he stood for is true. He came back from the dead. The resurrection is meant to be an earthquake in the world. Not just in the world of faith, but in the world. It's meant to make us stop and think and wonder. You know, in our, in our modern world, our modern mindset, we tend to think of people 2,000 years ago as naive and willing to believe anything. Not so. These people were smart. Like, they're just as smart as us. They were extremely hesitant to believe, especially something like this. You can see it in all of their words. St. Luke says they were startled and afraid, terrified. They had questions in their hearts and minds. They had their doubts. Remember Thomas last week, doubting Thomas. They were, as St. Luke says, incredulous for joy and were amazed. I love that phrase, incredulous for joy. It, it can't be. This can't be happening. It can't be him. And, and yet it was. It did happen. And it is him. What St. Luke and all of the Gospel writers go to great lengths to get across. This Jesus they're seeing is not a ghost or a spirit or a warm, a warm fuzzy feeling in the hearts of some disciples. They saw him. They touched him. They heard him speak. We see today they even ate with him after the resurrection. So he's proven he's not a, some figment of their imagination. Jesus then told them, Everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. You are witnesses to these things, he said to them. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. If you have an open mind, he will open yours too, to understanding. If, I say, so many in our world have already made up their minds that it isn't possible. Even though it happened, they think it's not possible. It can't be true. What they're really saying is, I don't want it to be true. Because if it is, I can't stay the same. 
I have to repent of my sins. He is God and man. This is strange 2,000 years ago and is strange today. Real faith in the resurrection is a judgment on the values of this world. Authentic Christianity has always been a threat to those powers in the world, to those powers that be. A watered-down faith, a bland, symbolic interpretation of the resurrection can easily be just set aside. A watered-down faith poses no real threat to anyone. It makes no real demands on you or anybody, believer or unbeliever. But that's not Christianity. That's not discipleship. Faith in Christ, faith in his resurrection, is an earthquake. This, folks, is what sets us apart from every other faith in the world. No other faith even makes a claim close to it. They don't even try. Jesus Christ, true God and true man, truly risen from the dead. Listen now how St. Peter ends his sermon from our first reading and how I'll end mine. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let us stand. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth.